YouTube. It's Brian Phillips. We're cutting this box open right now. This should be something that'll be great for beginners if you haven't already seen it before. Oh yeah, it's the 1220 millimeter Ranger. Look at that fancy dance. Now this particular one, I believe does come with optional floats too. I think so. So now we're not gonna show ours with the optional floats installed, but someday we hope to actually be doing a lot of float planes because we're trying to put a pond in on our property. But for now, we're just gonna show you how to get this thing out, get it set up and show you what it's all about. So here we go. If you wanna see one in a plug and plug and play configuration rather than the ready to fly, we have videos of this plane in a plug and play finish as well. So check the playlist and same thing is true for almost any plane that we've done in the past, you can check out brianphillipsrc.com and you can search by manufacturer or by style of aircraft to help find what you need to find. Okay. Evidently I've got a joiner rod or something in there. Okay. That must be for the tail feathers, I believe. Okay, so what do we need to know about this plane? This is 1220 millimeters. It's kind of a high wing trainer. It looks a little bit like a Cessna something or another. Cessna 172 or somewhere in that area. And it's a tricycle landing gear, which is pretty sweet. So it's a different experience than some of the Cubs that you might see where you've got uh, a tail dragger. So it's gonna fly a little bit different, have a little bit different flight experience. So let's go ahead and unpackage this as we go. We'll go over what we find. Obviously this came out, probably taped to the bottom. That's a float piece too. It separates the floats. Okay, so we've got some components here. Uh, looks like a rudder Y cable, some nut and bolt sacks, a bind cable. Uh, these things go on the end of the sticks and then a USB-C, USB A to C. We'll just throw that over there because we won't be using it. And what do we have here? This is probably for us our charger. Yep, that's our charger. So pretty basic one. It's got an AC power cable that comes in from one side. And then on the other side, we have our balance plug goes in here. And I'll show you that when we get to the battery portion, but we'll just get this untangled as we go. Now, the thing that's nice about these ready to flies is you get all the basic stuff you need, but that doesn't mean you're always gonna be getting the best thing that you could use. So in this case, you've got a Predator 1300 milliamp 3S pack. Now, how do we know it's 3S? Because there's four wires here on the balance lead. So that's one cell, then two cells, then three cells in series. And with the red being in parallel to the black most, okay? So this is the same as these two outside wires. So we're gonna go set this up to charge right now so we can take advantage of the time we're doing our unbox and build, okay? Okay, so we're just gonna plug this in here and then that's gonna go in like that. You may see some lights come on, okay? So it's got this little cycle and then this is keyed so it'll only go in one way and once it comes to life, it's gonna show you whether it's charging and which one it's charging. Okay, so charging is a solid red. Error is a flash. Standby is, I don't know, with a line under it. It's just, oh, it's like dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Like and then cycling. full would be green per cell. That's how this is all measured, okay? So if you wanted to know what was really going on with this battery pack, you could use what's called this XBC battery checker. Now there's a variety of different styles like this. But if you're new to the hobby, this is for a balance lead. It goes up to, I think, 8S. And then this is a different type of discharge end. It's called an EC, uh, excuse me, an IC3, which would be compatible with an EC3. So I can just unplug this charger and we can plug it in here, kind of key that in there, how it lines up. And you can see how much percentage basis is left. And then also how much each cell has on it, okay? Now there's a variety of other things you can do with that tool, but for now, we'll just go ahead and plug this into the charger. Now, I was just saying earlier that sometimes when you get these ready to fly planes, you get 
everything you need with the exception of a few items which we'll go over throughout the build but it may not be the best thing that you could use okay so this is the provided charger it's very basic it's not going to charge at an overly fast speed and we can actually tell you how fast it does charge by looking at the readings here it says input 100, uh, 100 through 240 ac at 50 to 60 hertz it's designed to charge a lithium ion or a lithium polymer this is a lithium polymer pack and it charges at 1000 milliamps okay so 1000 milliamp hours uh excuse me 1000 milliamps would be one amp and that's a 1300 milliamp power pack so if you take that and drop off the hours and you have 1300 milliamps on each of the cells when it's fully charged okay so it's going to take some time to charge now if you wanted a little bit faster charge then you could use something like this this would be an s155 it's a cheap um, but still very good charger it's going to give you flexibility to do some of the smart batteries and smart batteries would be in the same size class we've got a battery right here that's 1300 milliamp 3s as well except the difference is this one here has a smart chip that does its own battery management it's also going to keep the cells balanced and you can see that different style of connector i was talking about very similar same size openings on the actual pins but then it's got this extra data pin in the center okay so this is also compatible with ec3 this is an ic3 this is an xt60 so same size class you'll notice that this has some bigger gauge wires it's 12 gauge instead of a probably an 8 gauge or i don't know what this excuse me not an 8 gauge a 14 gauge and what i'll do is i'll show you how this would go in if you're going to use this type of battery you'd have to have some sort of an adapter that would take you into this incompatible type of connector so that's going to get you to ec which is compatible with ic3 then you plug this into your charger here and you can see you've got your live voltages and if you press play then you can set your speed from 1.1 will go up to 1.3 and that's just consistent with this markings on the battery so in this case this battery is 1300 milliamp hours so you would set it to 1.3 amp hours now but for the sake of our example today we'll go ahead and show it charged on the ready to fly provided charger but we just want to always point that out you don't have to necessarily use what comes in the ready to fly package in fact this plane will be capable of working with a spectrum transmitter and receiver combo if you like or even futaba or open tx and you just have to choose whichever receiver you want and you can just take out the ready to fly receiver should you really want to do that now i'm not suggesting you do that especially if you're brand new as a pilot we don't want to confuse the issue but we do want you to understand that there's some flexibility there because this is after all just a plug and play uh, airplane all right so as we unpack this thing we'll keep going through the process of explaining everything now being that this is a beginner plane you may understand um, a little bit more than some people you may understand a little bit less and so we'll kind of go into the weeds a little bit more than normal so of course we've got our wing here we've got one aileron servo here so this nine gram digital servo speaks to the weight of the actual servo and that helps us to distinguish the size compared to a larger servo like a 13 gram servo or a 23 gram servo or a 30 gram servo or so on and so forth and this wing strut is going to help to brace the wing so that it doesn't pull up too high when it's under load and it's actually holding up the plane now if you've never seen a foam plane these things are made of foam some steel aluminum sometimes there's plastic like this with a nut zert in it and then they're very well manufactured you can see there's a little bit of give to it but not very much and it's super detailed you can get these cool contours but then you don't have to have a super complex lengthy labor intensive process of building a wooden model now you can still build wooden models today believe it or not but the thing is it's just a lot more expensive to put together a wooden plane so all right so you can see here this is fly sky uh, fly sky fs 
14X. It's got a power switch here that says V-mix, rudder, throttle, elevator, ailerons. So it's re reverse and normal. And then that's a VTEL mix. And then this is the bind key. And then some foam on there. These are trim adjustments for each of the four channels. And then there's a lanyard point, switch A, three position, switch B, three position. And then there is a trainer port here with an, uh, looks like a, I forget what type that is, a PS2 connector, okay? And then it takes four double A's, but I do not believe they're provided for us. Now also you may be noticing that there's screws sticking out instead of having the end of these sticks. Now I don't know why they do this, but they do it on this particular brand of transmitter. And so you can screw these on yourself and you can bring those down and they act as a jam nut. So suppose you wanted to make this longer, then you can actually back that off a little bit. See how it sticks out further now than the other stick. And then you can run this down and you can run this back up and you can make it create a bit of a jam nut. So that makes the sticks longer or shorter to your exact tailored feel. Now I'm gonna just run them all the way down and then torque them down, okay? So that's gonna be my throttle. This is a rudder. This will be elevator and ailerons. So it's gonna roll the airplane like this. This is gonna make it pitch up or down. So up or down. This is gonna yaw the airplane with the rudder. And then this is throttle. Of course, it's gonna go faster or slower. And then those two additional buttons are gonna choose between modes. And if you have flaps, it will deploy the flaps or not, okay? Then we have an instruction manual in here, folded twice. not once, but twice. It's like useless. So that really ticks me off. I hate folded manuals. And if you're anything like me, this will drive you crazy. So now I have to sit here and try to unfold this stupid thing. Luckily, we don't really need it. Luckily, we don't read manuals so much anyway. I'm not sure you helped with that in that case. Well, it's at least sort of flat. <laughs> Okay, so we have some, uh, these are gonna be used for the floats. They kind of go into the bottom of the fuse. And then these pieces actually separate the floats on the bottom. Now, in a later video, we may end up going ahead and doing some float operations with this plane. We have floats on many planes that we have in our, in our fleet, which is hundreds of different planes, but we don't have a great place to use floats. And so we'll come back to that when we do have a good place to use floats. And so if you're curious, if we've ever used floats on this particular plane and you're watching this in like six years, then you can check the playlist and there's a good possibility that we'll have already added some of that footage. So the playlists are a great resource on YouTube. You can identify things that we have done that maybe you aren't aware of yet in the, you know, where we are in the video right now. Okay, so this is aluminum landing gear. It's got a little bit of squish to the tires, but not a lot plastic wheels, plastic wheels, a small standoff with a nut to provide some separation so that these things spin somewhat free and they should track relatively straight, but they will splay out on landing a little bit, okay? You don't want them to splay out too far and cause damage, but it is just a fact of life. Okay, so now continuing through the unbox, just go ahead and keep pulling pieces out. All right, so we have the other wing. Looks pretty much like the other side. Nothing special to see here. And as we untape everything, just make sure that you are getting all that residue and everything off. And these little chunks of foam that stick all over everything, we'll grab as we go. Oh, and then also, in terms of thickness and strength, here's just a little bit of visual for you. When I hold that up against the light, you can see that it resists the light passing through it because it's got an opaque paint finish here. And then this little touch up, that's actually a decal that goes up here. And then this is just clear. We've got a little bit of, looks like spent glue here possibly. Some glue, yeah, just came right off. Okay, so I just took this tape and I'll actually take a little bit more pressure, see if I can get that to peel. That doesn't want to peel. It's an impurity in the foam on that one. Don't do that on your painted surface. Yep. If you have something on your paint. It's going to pull the paint tape. right off. Okay, so now continuing down to the bottom of the box, 
we're just kind of slowly working our way into the package. I always unfold the package like this so that I can remember how to put it back together. And if you intend to take your plane apart and put it back in the box, do the same. Uh, otherwise, it's actually pretty hard to remember what direction these things go. So we've got the fuse here. Mostly assembled fuse. We've got the spinner missing. Okay, so if you look at all that, it looks really, really nice. Nice, clean paint jig. See, nice, clean mm -hmm. lines here. And then right here, you've got this big reinforced plastic belly. And then you've got this spring, this ugly as sin landing gear. And you're probably like, why would you want something so ugly? Well, you do when you're a beginner pilot. And we'll show you what we mean, okay? And you guys might recognize this from the battery. And this is the receiver that comes, uh, that will attach then to the Fly Sky transmitter, okay? And then that is the Reflex V2, which is our flight controller stabilizer. Okay, and then of course the prop, if you look right here, it should say what size it is on most, but it doesn't on this one. That's probably like an eight or 10, 10 five or 10 six maybe, maybe 11. And then you can see here, we've got a vent hole and we've got vents up here too, okay? So there might be some more cowl decorations that go on here, but there will definitely be a spinner. All right, so we'll just keep going through the unbox. Looks like the horizontal stabilizers at the bottom, which also has the bottom portion of the fuse with this big piece of plastic built in. And that's gonna receive the screws and transfer that load so you don't have to tape everything together. And then this piece of plastic transfers the left and right side of the elevators so that it can carry between the two sides because there's only one linkage that controls the entire throw of the elevator, okay? So this is the horizontal stabilizer, and this is the elevator. So that's what's gonna control the pitch of the airplane, and this is gonna keep it going straight. All right, cool. Then we have the floats in the bottom of the box. Okay, so we have float number one of two. Got this nice little inner lip here. No reinforcements on these floats. These are really inexpensive, basic floats. Some of the higher, more sophisticated ones will have a hard plastic layer here and here because that's where you're gonna run into the ground or you're gonna run into the water. And I say ground or water because you can fly these off of snow. So it's really fun to do that if you ever get an opportunity. However, in this application, we have a water rudder. So let's talk about the water rudder for a minute. So the water rudder is gonna operate right off of the rudder channel and then this thing is actually going to be functioning to steer the aircraft in the water, but there's no breakaway. So if you knew you were gonna fly this on floats and you were gonna do it on snow, you'd probably wanna take this off. Otherwise it will break off automatically. Um, okay, cool. So that's all the goodies that were inside this box. I'm just gonna quickly flip these things back into the box. And the reason I do that is because we have so many different planes and this is probably a good time to let you know you're in the right place if you're a brand new pilot or you're trying to become a brand new pilot. At Brian Phillips RC, we're here to serve you and help you get over the hump because really at the end of the day, a lot of times all you need is just that little nudge to get you in the air. So we'll take a second and do this and come right back. All right, folks, so we're gonna get this thing built. A Couple of tools you might wanna have around while you're doing this build would be this thing, which is a plane stand. If this is your first plane, you don't need to have a plane stand, but it will make your life easier. And this thing comes in at like, I think less than $30 ship most places. Um, also, another thing you're not gonna need for this build, but you wanna have on hand is China glue. China glue. Your handwriting is upside down. China glue. This is also the same type of material. It's like a mucilage based product, they come in these aluminized tubes and it's a clear, almost like rubber cement sort of finish. Now you might want some CA as well um, and that's gonna be like a super glue, but just keep in mind with different types of foam, there's different types of super glue requirements. And in this case, you'd need a foam safe super glue. You're not gonna be using any glue on this particular model until you crash it. And when you do, which is gonna happen, 
then you can use this to repair it. We do all sorts of repairs on this channel and basically we have crashed all sorts of different planes on this channel and we try to show how to fix stuff and we do it pretty much all the time. So just watch this channel for a while and you're bound to see me crash. But if you're buying this from Horizon, you could order this while you're ordering or if you're buying this from FMS, then you would buy it from, you would buy this tube. And I would get a couple tubes of this, it's mm -hmm. cheap. I think it goes for like five or six bucks. It's really inexpensive. This stuff's a little bit more expensive, but it also lasts for a really long time. So if you buy this and it sits for a couple of years, it should still work. There's an offering at Hobby King too, but we don't like it as much. It's called mucilage. You can get it in a large tube or a small tube. If you get it, get the small tubes yeah. because it's not gonna last. It always seems to dry out in the tubes. We haven't had that problem with either of these China glues. Mm -mm. Also, I wanted to just point out that this spinner was popped off of mine when I first pulled this out of the box. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you how to put that back on. First thing you can see right here, this can be tightened if needed, but this snaps on. It's kind of an unusual design. Usually it's screwed on with a screw, but this one goes on super easy. And then to remove it, you have to just kind of snap it off. See, I just kind of squeeze. Okay, so if yours came like that, you'll have the same problem. Okay, so now in terms of assembly, this should be a pretty easy process. We'll go through the process, try to painstakingly go over many details that you may already understand. And so for that reason, we apologize. Oh, and then other tools you might wanna have. Uh, we have this little set that we, we had, one of our subscribers actually sent this to us and they've got different tip sizes. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna know what that is, just let us know in the comments below, we'll, we'll link to it for you. Um, but basically they suggest putting the landing gear on first, should be a pretty straightforward process as you can see. <coughs> it's keyed, so it lays out right where it fits. Very basic stuff. And then this thing goes in on top of it right after we get our screws in. So we have to use short or long screws, did you look? Short in the front and long in the back. Now let's show the people the hardware. Short, long, okay? Mm -hmm. So short in the front and long in the back? Yes. What do you mean? Like what's the front and the back? The two short ones up here and then two long okay. ones back here. So the two long ones go in here. And I believe they're gonna go through the white That seems cover. like they go through the cover? Why would, mm -hmm. they, why would they countersink that? Let's look at the drawing together. So the drawing does show the instructions, okay? And I, I'm not really sure I believe that they're gonna go through the plastic as well. Cause it looks like you lay that down and then they're saying that we go through the plastic, really? Why did they countersink those? That's weird. Okay, so you see how they're countersunk here? Right here and here, okay? These are countersunk at the bottom of the hole but they're also countersunk here. So I suppose the old design, maybe the old design didn't have this piece in it. This is like a V2, okay? So we need the short screws on the front because they're not going through as much different plastic piece. Okay, and this is two millimeter drive that we're using. So we'll just get that sucked down there. And it did come with that little Allen key, which is- Oh, it does come with the tool. Yeah, yeah. We, don't, we don't see these very often anymore. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and show you why we like using the driver. As you can see, it's quite easy to use and it's light. If you have to use this thing regrettably because you don't have another choice, then you'll be doing this, which is not the end of the world. So it is a ready to fly. You think that they would be including these. They kind of stopped including them inside of the airplanes in the last couple of years. And I've noticed that and said, that's kind of strange. But it's fine because we have so many of these different airplanes that we have a plethora of the Allen tools. And most of them are a two millimeter. You, know, if you don't have a huge set of drivers. Now, how, why do you think I'm still going? Because it's not flush here yet. So if you take your finger and you feel long here and it doesn't feel flush, then that's probably because it's not done yet. You'll tell when it's done because it'll stop moving. Like right there. So that feels pretty flush. Okay, great. Okay. So that was super easy. And then we need to put the tail on. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna just turn this and reposition it a little bit. Like I said, if you don't have the plane stand, you can lay it on the table. You can take some blankets and lay them out. 
you can just throw the thing wherever, it's no big deal. So in this case, I need to lay this in here by folding this into the opening. See that? That little key is going to drop down in here. And then that goes like that. It's very basic, very simple assembly. Long screws. Long screws according to the camera crew. So we're just going to drop those in there and then get started. I don't have alignment yet because I haven't pushed far enough. Now this should drop down in. Yep, now it's dropped down in. And you can always tell when it gets close because it's going to start puckering the foam. See the foam, how it's starting to pucker there? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is these manufacturers take the plastic and they make these bearing surfaces that go across a large piece of foam. And then that helps hold everything together without glue. And it used to be back when we just, you know, not too long ago, not quite a decade ago, when we started doing this, we used to have to glue a lot of stuff together. Mm -hmm. And so that China glue was almost required on just about every build. Granted, they included it on many builds. Okay, so there's gonna be some additional steps after we get the radio setup done to hook up this linkage here to the elevator. But we need that to go to its home position because we don't want to hook it up now, it's going to be pulling it way down or probably actually beyond where it should be, okay? So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now, again, we don't even need the plane stand now just because this plane, first of all, they are slick. And so you're going to notice that about certain planes, sometimes they're very slick and they're hard to hold. And so you got to get some friction on there. All right, so now assembling the wing should be a relatively easy process, but do we have a wing spar? Your nope, but you just screw the two pieces of the wing together flat with the short screws. Right. But I mean, there's no wing spar. Is there really no wing spar? Did I maybe forget something in my in my instructions? I don't remember. Because normally there's a wing spar on this type of thing. So if there's a wing, we hate folded manuals, by the way. I don't know if we mentioned that earlier. No, no. there isn't. We just have these quick decouplers. Mm -hmm. Then we have to plug in the Y cable. <coughs> Excuse me. So this Y cable, actually, I'm just gonna move this out of the way. The Y cable should already be installed. If it's not, we'll have to get it out of this bag. So right here, off the reflex, there's one cable that comes out and this is the output for the wings, okay? Then also, why we have access to the top and the front I want to press this thing here and then open the hood. Okay. Pull this out and I want to grab this lead and pull this through. This is a battery lead and then oops. Oh shoot. Rip that warning off and threw it right in the garbage. So strange how that happened. I'm going to show you another trick of the day right now. See this Velcro? You see how effective that is because it's barely touching anything. It's sort of a waste of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually take some scissors and we're gonna modify this a little bit. Because this battery, as you can see here, their intentions are to, to put Velcro on the battery and then hold it in that way, but that's not gonna work very good, especially given the fact that it's only touching a small percentage of the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so what we like to use is this stuff called shelf liner. And this is the sort of thing that you put underneath, like if you have a shelf liner, then you put it under things that you don't want to slip and slide around in your shelf. And then this stuff works fantastic for this step. And we'll show you what we use. So over here, I'm gonna also modify the way that this came out because I want it to be on both sides of that opening. So I'm just gonna cut this. Buyer beware, you might get a little bit of sticky stuff on your scissors, so do that with care. Okay, so we're gonna drop that down. We're going to take the other half. We're just going to put it here in the front. And then you'll also see right here, there is a spot where your steering servo, you see the steering, the rudder servos back here is going to go to the linkage to your steerable nose gear. Okay. That same servo drives the rudder. Okay. Now we don't want to turn those just to see the action. You want to run the servo because it's really hard on servos to do that. 
Also, let's take a second and talk about what this is. This is some more hardware that's used if we were to install the floats. So this Y cable would steal signal from the rudder output, which is right here. You'd have to just pick the right one that says rudder. It's the last one that direction, okay? You would unplug that and then you would plug this Y cable in and plug the rudder back in. And then the other half would attach to this thing as you route that into the bottom of the plane. And then you would have redundant controls on your rudder and on the water rudder, okay? So this is going to be used for later assembly. Also, this cable that I threw off to the side is a USB-A to USB-C, and that's used if we need to reprogram this thing in here called the Reflex V2, which is our flight controller. You don't generally have to do anything with that, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Now, since we separated our Velcro, I'm gonna go ahead and cut mine just like this. And then I'm gonna take my shelf liner. And we're gonna go ahead and stick this stuff to it. This might just take me a quick second to do because I don't have very big of nails. All right, so we've got that started and peeled. And then I like to just stick it down on. And then we'll do the same thing over here. Okay, that stuff is kind of hard to peel. Sorry, folks. So then we'll take that and we'll just do the, the same thing. Now, what is the objective of the shelf liner? I think it should be self-explanatory by the time you get to the point where you're putting it in your own plane. But if it weren't already obvious, what that's gonna do is that's gonna prevent the battery from slipping around. So you can apply very minimal pressure with the Velcro strap. That's gonna hold it into this material and then this material is gonna prevent it from slipping back and forth because that battery constitutes a bit of a counterweight and we use that to set the center of gravity in this airplane. So we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But for now, I'm gonna use a screwdriver to just lift this strap and get it on top of that steerable nose gear, okay? So this is not a spatially aware receiver it's just a receiver. That's all it does is just transmits and receive data from here to here. It is full duplex. There is some telemetry data, I believe. And this uses AFHDS. So that's the uh, version of protocol that's being used for communication. Okay, so then that, since it's not spatially aware, can just be tucked in back here. Just keeping in mind that whatever you do with that, you wanna to try to mitigate as much potential risk of binding up your control surfaces as you can, okay? And you're probably thinking to yourself, but Brian, those wires are just going all about that. Truth is, some planes, it's not gonna be as critical because it's not like tightly wrapped next to it. And say you've got a wire here and you've got a rod that wants to go back and forth, it's just gonna move the wire out of the way most of the time. You just don't want a big bundle of wires that's gonna be taut that's gonna prevent and resist that movement on the rudder or on the steerable nose gear in this case, okay? So we're good there. So now, what's our next move? We have to get these wires landed first. And how do we do that? Well, we get the color for color. So we have brown on the top in this case and the top. So it's keyed together. It shouldn't go if it's not lined up right, but you can actually force them if you're not careful, okay? So I like to take these wires, when they pop out like that, I'll go ahead and push them back in. I like to pull that so it doesn't have that nasty look to it. Okay, so brown is up on my right hand and brown is up on my left hand. Then I just make a flat surface with my middle finger See that the pad of my finger provides backing so that I can slide this in. Otherwise it's quite difficult to get in between those. And what are these extra, these things are just, um, they prevent them from coming undone. So in order to get that released, you have to come in here and pull those while trying to unplug. It's real difficult, but that's the key. You want it to be difficult. Okay, then you can just drop these back in, but there is, one step, and the camera crew is completely on the wrong side to show you this, so she's gonna move her body. 
So this is going to need to slide in here, okay? So once you're slid in, and you're going to go back, okay? Like that. You're like, geez, Brian, that seems like it's kind of a pain. Well, sometimes the steps are a little bit of a pain. But I can tell you this, it's not that hard. It's just more a matter of the first time it's a little bit hard to get the plastic together, okay? And that's why I'm doing it with the wings off. I can hold this bulkhead and then slip them back, okay? Then the wires, you see the wires? They just drape in here gently and should be no problem. Then I line up these two little doohickeys and it's ready to rock and roll. And there's keys on the front that's right here and here that it drops down into. You are supposed to screw that together from the bottom side too. What now? The, there's two short screw holes on the bottom side. What? To screw the whole wing assembly together. Okay, so you can't do it this way, okay. Well, I think you can still have it on there. Okay, yep, there's two screws. So the two screws go in the bottom. We'll come right back. Okay, so we got the screwdriver. We're just gonna put these things together and then they're gonna tighten in here. Now, if you guys ever decide you wanna add inboard flaps, they would go here and they would go here. And that is something that has to be added. Uh, you'll have to buy servos and all sorts of stuff and we've done it on other Rangers in the past, and it's a really fun modification. But it's not needed to make this plane fly. It's just flaps really improve. They give you a lot of other um, fun stuff that you can do with the plane. It's like you can slow it down a lot. There's a lot of other cool things you can do. But for now, we're not gonna get into it too much. I wanna use some tape on this step. You don't have to do this, but I'm gonna do it anyway because these wires keep popping out on me and it's kind of driving me nuts. So I'm just gonna drop these into the, the groove. I do like that the orange goes downward. I'm actually gonna tip the plane on its side. Okay. And I can push this down into the groove. I was hoping that orange would go down because it's a little bit less noticeable. Okay, so once we get this in, then I'm gonna just tape those in. Okay, so I always like to cut with scissors so you don't get the ridges. Okay, so we like to, okay, we'll try that again. So if you have the right amount, I'm gonna stick it to the scissors this time. And all this is gonna do is it's basically gonna force that stuff to stay in the pocket. It's a really easy process. It will add a little bit of kind of keeping the wires in so you don't have to deal with that every time you pull the wings off. Okay, so we'll go about like that. Just kind of ballpark. All right, I'm gonna stick that all the way onto the flat of the servo. Just kind of run my finger out. So now guys, if you like this type of content, this long format, um, how to topical stuff here on YouTube at Brian Phillips RC, make sure you smash the like button. We get punished routinely by YouTube for doing long format. Everybody wants to do shorts these days, but nobody wants to explain all the questions that go along with building these airplanes. They just want you to buy them. Uh, but doesn't nobody really knows what they're doing when they're brand new and they need a lot of help and so that's why we started this channel a long time ago is because we found that we couldn't get answers to a lot of the questions we had and so now that we've been doing this for some time we've pretty much come up with a solution for many of those questions okay so you see those two wires now that we've done this twice i'm going to go ahead and twist this wing several times and the reason i'm doing that is because i don't want to fight those wires getting into my rudder and steerable nose gear, okay? So you see, I don't have near enough spin yet. 
So I'm gonna just do that three or four more times. And there's probably an easier way to do it, like say before you plug them in. But the thing is, I wanna actually wrap it up the way that it's gonna wrap, okay? So now I can take and pull this wrap to wherever I want. You see how that kind of keeps it together? And then look what happens when you drop the wing. It just falls right into place, okay? So now I'm gonna take and tip it toward my belly. I've got it braced into my belly, and then I just pull it in. Okay, did I get the wires in? I can't see. Yes, I can't see any on the side. Okay, so then these clips, they drop into both left and right side. So I'll just do this one first. It's gonna to go toward the camera crew, and then I'm gonna pivot them around actually that one. Hold on, let me see. Ooh, that doesn't feel quite right. It's like I'm not in there. Ooh, that really, you gotta twist that thing hard. I don't remember that. There it is, guys. Okay, so you can see they line up so they've got that wind vane shape to them. Then we'll come in and clip these and they went just fine. So anyway, that was all for naught. All right, it's been a long time since I built this plane. All right, so there you have it, guys. The 1220 millimeter Ranger, pretty easy to build. And then also just taking note of something, I just wanna point out this, this color. Doesn't look so good, but once that thing goes in there, it's gonna mesh up with the, with the black. If that's too unsavory for you, just take your black marker and color it in. So the next thing that we have to do to get this plane ready to fly is we actually need to set up this last linkage, which is gonna happen as part of the radio setup. Now the radio setup is super duper easy on a ready to fly airplane. It just basically consists of turning things on. So our next move is actually gonna be to get ourselves four AA batteries and install them. We'll be right back and do that. Okay, so you'll grab your transmitter, pop off the back. The flat goes to the spring. Flat goes to the spring. The flat goes to the spring and so on and so forth. Okay, and then replace your cover. All right, so the power comes on. We've got a green light. This says high, mid, and low, okay? I believe that just speaks to the batteries that are in here, okay? So now the next thing we need to do is we need to get the battery and actually install it. This is where you need to use caution. Let's talk about what's going on with our charger right now. There's two green lights and one red light, okay? So what does that mean? That means that one cell is still charging and then two cells are good, okay? So let's unplug and show you what it looks like on a cell checker or on our XBC battery checker, which is also a servo tester. That is plenty good for what we need, okay? So basically what that tells me is that our voltage is equal enough on each of the three cells. And so we can just disregard that middle red light and go to town with this. Now we have calipers and a marker so we can mark the center of gravity in a second here. So let's go ahead and undo this strap. Okay, I wanna open this up so we can get this somewhere in the middle. Now there's another tool that, well actually let's talk about that. You can stay right there. Okay. There's another tool that we've got that you might wanna think about getting your hands on and it's called a voltage alarm. So it's like this and this is gonna help you to know when your battery's dead. So you just look on the back here, it says minus and plus, and this says 1S through 8S, okay? In our case, this is a 3S. So the minus side, you plug it in and then you can set with this little button right here, you can set what the alarm is gonna alarm at. So 3.3 volts, it's gonna alarm. We're at 4.2, 4.22, and 4.2, okay? So now, I can take and plug this in, but you have to be super careful because there is a prop and it's live. Um, it could potentially start because we don't trust the system. We also don't have a throttle cut on here. Now, normally there'd be a throttle cut on a computerized transmitter and we would use that to help protect us and lock that position in case you would bump the throttle. And so you have to be careful, but there is some arming process to the ESC. 
So in this case, what we're gonna do is I'll just show you how I would protect myself. And yes, I will do it with the plane and the prop facing me, or I'll do it with the prop away from me, but I'm not gonna make sure, I'm gonna make sure that I don't get my hands or I'm gonna get cut if that were to be spinning, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is just energize the circuit and test it. So you see my hands are out of the way. You also notice that that happened after. Okay, listening. If that thing started, my hands and arms would be free of the prop. Okay, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn it away from myself, give it a little bit of throttle. So it's armed, okay? And I'm just gonna make sure this is in a safe spot. It's not gonna get bumped. And then I'm gonna go ahead and slide my lead in. And then I get this thing strapped in. Now, having a healthy respect for the dangers associated with a prop is probably the most important part of safety in flight safety and RC safety is just lipo safety. That's number one. And then props would be number two. Okay. Crashing into yourself is, it, I mean, it's a risk, but it just doesn't like people don't get hurt that often because you usually just jump out of the way. Yeah. You might crash in your house or to a car or some other people, but uh, it's very unusual that people get hurt by that. But what they do get hurt with is the prop. And so you want to be super careful. And then lipos, that's the other thing you got to be careful about. So now you may have remembered that we don't actually have the elevator attached yet either. So I'm going to turn this away from me because we have nothing to gain by having it facing us now. The elevator, elevator's not doing anything. The rudder is, and the ailerons are. So we're good on all three of those fronts. But we need to go ahead and get the linkage installed for the elevator. So how do we do that? Well, first things first, we have to have it energized. So now that we have it energized, you can see that the, the servo is pointed down, okay? So the servo is pointed down. When I move the stick, you can see it moves the corresponding servo, okay? So now that's gonna, that's gonna attach to this linkage here. Now in the instruction manual, it's gonna tell you where to actually land it. So on the elevator, it's saying the outside of the horn and the outside of the arms. So that's the outside of the arm. Now this arm has four holes and the drawing in the book only has three. So I'm gonna to refer to another page and see if it doesn't have anything else. All right, so there isn't anything else, so. But they've opened up the hole here. So this is where I'm gonna put mine. See, that hole was opened up. That's gonna provide less throw on the elevator than this outside most hole, okay? So now I know, based on the drawing, they want it in the outside hole. The inside hole would provide the maximum movement paired up with the outside hole of this arm, okay? But in our case, we're going from the next outside to the outside, okay? We want this to be level, as in mechanically straight. See, I gotta screw this way in to make that work. So I got three fingers holding tight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Why do I count out loud? Because then you can kind of get an idea of how many I had to do. That's gonna be close. Gotta go at least one more. Maybe two. See how it's not quite square? That's gonna be about right. So you see, that's actually pointed down. So I gotta go, I gotta go out one half a turn. Okay, so that's one half. Let's see what we look like now. Not enough, right? Mm -mm. Okay, out another half turn. Okay, so we'll line this up. Oh, that's closer. Nope, out another half. So. Okay, so there's one more half, and then that should get us pretty darn close, okay? So you see that's really straight, okay? So now we can snap that through and then pull this little piece of fuel, fuel hose back and check the elevator. Okay, up, down, all right, cool. 
So now let's talk about the direction of travel on all these surfaces before we get into the center of gravity, which will be next. Elevator up, elevator down, roll left, roll right, yaw left, yaw right. Now look at the steerable nose gear. So I wanna to turn to the left, there's to the left. I wanna to turn to the right, there's to the right. Okay, so everything is working in the correct direction. So we don't need to reverse any of these switches. Okay, so that's very important. So now the other thing is we need to make sure our center of gravity is correct so that the plane pivots at the right spot. Otherwise the elevator will not have enough authority to pivot the plane, okay? And so it'll fly either too stable or it'll fly too understable. So it's gonna be very light on the elevator and too touchy or it's gonna be too heavy on the elevator. So the center of gravity is the point from front to back of the plane that the plane will pivot, okay? And this elevator can only actuate the plane on the correct center of gravity. If you have the center of gravity way back here, it's gonna be way too much weight up front. So you're not gonna have enough elevator to impact that change, okay? If it's too far to the forward, then the elevator is gonna be barely have to move to change the pitch, the attitude of the airplane. And so you want to get the center of gravity right in the center of gravity. Okay, so how do we know where the center of gravity is? Well, in this case, we have it in a book. Just keep in mind, this is powered on at this point. Okay, so the center of gravity is 50 to 60 millimeters. So I'm going to measure out 50 and I'm going to measure out 60. Okay, so that's close enough. So here's 50 from the leading edge of the wing. There's one mark. From the leading edge of the wing, there's one mark, okay? And then I'm gonna go to 60. So this thing has got a huge range. Close enough. Okay, so a front mark and a back mark. All right, and then why do I have a marker? The marker is to go in and follow up with a marking, okay? And that's so that we can easily find where those points are. And you'll notice that I made an actual dent in the finish of the airplane. <clears throat> I'm gonna make sure that's all the way down on the throttle. I'm gonna flip the plane over. You may notice the servo's moving around a little bit. That's normal, we'll talk about that in a minute. So I got my fingers on the back hole and it's just perfectly fine. And on the front hole, it's leaning back, okay? So now come around here, camera crew. If I open up the battery tray, the battery could stand to go forward until it hits the bulkhead. And that's all the more we can do in terms of this factory setup without adding nose weight, okay? So now I'm gonna get my hands on the back hole. I just have it bouncing on the longest finger, my middle finger, and it's level. And then on the front hole, it's tail heavy, okay? So what that means is it's gonna to tend to be a little bit more sensitive on the elevator than it could otherwise be, okay? <clears throat> so if you wanna make this plane fly a little bit more stable, you can use a slightly bigger battery. Now, it's provided with a 1300 milliamp 3S, and these are 1300 milliamp 3S as we just charged these up, but my 1300 milliamp 3S might be a little bit heavier or it might be a little bit shorter, which means I can bring the weight a little bit further forward. So we might try one of those. Now, the other thing too, is if you have a 2200 3S, that would be a bigger, instead of being 1300 milliamps, it'd be 2200 milliamps. That's gonna put weight in front of the center of gravity, so it's gonna make it heavier, okay? <clears throat> so if I were to take out that battery and put this one in instead, it's gonna be quite a bit bigger. It's also gonna be heavier, so you may have to slide this battery back to achieve the center of gravity results that you want, okay? But I would say right now, for practical purposes, we're already good enough to fly this plane, okay? If you had a really touchy center of gravity on a high-performance jet or 3D plane, then you might need to spend a little bit more time fine-tuning it, but I think we're good enough on this application, especially as a ready-to-fly. They're expecting it to be they're expecting it to be forgiving on the center of gravity, okay? 
So if you guys don't already have a pair of calipers, you can just use uh, regular measuring tape and just use Google to do your translation of your different measurements. All right, great. <clears throat> so that's all the basic flight control surfaces are moving in the right direction. Now we need to figure out where they've set up the modes. Okay, we're gonna talk about modes. There's three different modes. One is an auto leveling mode, where when you let go of the sticks, the plane automatically writes the plane. It does it all itself through the flight controller. Now there's another mode where there's nothing. And you won't hear this. See how it's quiet? Nothing is correcting. So when I swing this, the, the rudder doesn't move, the elevator doesn't move, the ailerons don't move, and it doesn't try to bring the plane to the right mode or to upright. So now this is gonna bring you all the way to level, okay? So now look at the elevator. If you're pointed down, you see the elevator, it's pointed up, so it's gonna try to bring the plane until it's level. Or it's gonna try to bring the plane to level when you let go of the sticks, okay? So you can see it's trying to find the quickest route to level. So when you pass by even, it goes the other way. Okay, so it's trying to roll this down and that up or this up and that down until such a time as you get to where it's level. Okay, then it no longer needs to correct. Now this also has stabilization as well. Okay, so that's here. Okay, auto leveling. In fact, we're gonna label our transmitter so that we know what that is. Careful, please, that's mm -hmm. live and no throttle cut. So this is auto leveling. And then there's off, and then there's stabilizer. So stabilized, off, auto level. Okay, those are the three different modes of action within the Reflex V2, okay? That Reflex is the orange thing that was mounted about here. The receiver is just the transmission, uh, the, it's just doing the servo controls, okay? So if you decided, you're like, but Brian, I just spent all this money on this NX10 and I would really like to use this as opposed to this relatively inexpensive ready to fly transmitter, which I must say, this is actually a pretty nice ready to fly transmitter. It's got, it's got some beef to it. Um, it's gonna be nothing compared to one of these computerized transmitters, okay? You're not gonna have the screen, you're not gonna have all the bells and whistles. But the thing is, this uses a different protocol than the receiver that comes in this FlySky system, okay? So FlySky is going to be like the economy line of the economy lines. It's the cheapest receiver you can get. But if you want to, you can use this and we'll pause and show you what you would purchase. So this would be what you would use if you're buying this as a plug and play or plug and fly and you have the Reflex V2 installed because this is not spatially aware. It's got extremely limited telemetry like pack voltage. Uh, like receiver voltage, not flight pack voltage, rather, check that. This also has the push button for bind, which is nice. Now, if you wanted to go full on plug and fly, then you could use the 630 or 631, which would give you AS3X and safe, which is Spectrum's answer to the auto leveling and stabilizer. It's actually quite a bit, I don't wanna say it's quite a bit better, it's just more sophisticated. And the other thing that you can add with this is that you can go ahead and add flapperons, which would allow you to separate your left and right ailerons and operate them on their own channel so you can bring them down at the same time, thus adding the performance for slowing down the plane, similar to what you would get from inboard flaps without adding inboard flaps. However, my suggestion to you is you can actually add inboard flaps with this if you want because there is a spare channel at the top end and you would be controlling it with this, okay? Now, I'm not gonna suggest you do that necessarily because you can't tie your flaps to your elevator. Normally, the flaps would go down on an inboard flap and there'd be a small correction on the elevator so that your plane doesn't balloon, okay? And that's just where it lifts up really high, okay? So just a couple things to consider. Now, if you bought this as a ready to fly 
and you're like, I really need the help to go through the full setup to make this 630 or 631 or 637T work, and I don't know where to start, Brian, that's where you would go back to our other video in the playlist where we set this up using the AR630 or 631. So we'll pause and put this stuff up. But just to be clear, it would be considerably more expensive and complicated to set this thing up on an NX10, okay? Now, you wouldn't need the NX10 to do this particular plane, but my experience has been, if you're serious enough to get into a computerized transmitter and you're working your way through the ranks of airplanes, I suggest that people don't chase good money after bad, just get what you're gonna get that's gonna get you for two or three years of time in the hobby. And then you can upgrade later if you wanna go up to something even more expensive, you can obviously do that anytime you want. But my, my predisposition is if you're gonna spend three or $400 on an entry level transmitter, why not just spend 550 and be done with it? And then you don't have to buy another transmitter at all for like, you know, for hundreds of planes. I have like 165 planes in that mm -hmm. transmitter, which is not all of them by the way, but that's just a lot of them. Okay, so as you can see, we've got a manual here. And then, yeah, <clears throat> you see that picture? Yeah. That steerable nose gear. If you leave that on when you're flying floats, that's embarrassing. <laughs> but I'm sure people do it. So that being all understood, the way this is gonna work is just like any other plane that's in mode two, okay? Mode two is gonna give you your throttle here. So I'm gonna just brace it a little bit. You can see that starts your prop. This yaws your plane left and right. Elevator up and down, and then rolls left and right. And with stabilizer on, it's gonna resist the impact of wind. The stabilizer is the only feature we haven't talked about yet. I mean, we've mentioned it, but we haven't talked about how it works. So I'm gonna hold the camera and show you what this looks like. Okay, so as you can see, there is a rudder. When I move this plane, you see how it points to the right as I move to the right, and it points to the left as I move to the left. And when I stop, it stops, okay? Now look at the aileron. Watch this, I'm gonna lift the wing up fast, see how it goes up, see how it goes down, but it's not trying to right the plane because if I stop here, it just stays. All of the control axis, primary controls, would be pitch, yaw, and roll, okay? So with control of those three axis, you can change the position of your aircraft, whatever you want. You can mix controls, all these things, come into play from you as the controller of the aircraft. Well, what happens when the wind whips the wing down, okay? The stabilizer tries to resist that movement. So if you are setting up a stabilizer, you have to make sure that it goes opposite the direction that environmental impact is. This is environmental impact. This is me moving the stick, okay? If I move the stick, then the receiver knows he moved the stick. So it's okay, go ahead and move, right? But if it yanks like this, because the wind shears me over, then it's gonna respond by moving the opposite direction to try to resist until there is a stoppage of the environmental impact. Now in this case, that's why when I spin the plane like this, and you're watching that rudder go, or go, or go, what's happening is it's trying to resist the impact. But because I keep spinning, it's not stopping, so I'm gonna to continue to resist. What happens is people set up the stabilizers so they get them going the wrong direction. So instead of resisting the environmental impact, they exaggerate the environmental impact, yeah. and then you get into an uncontrollable spin. So if you ever take off your plane and it flips over on its back, it's because you have your stabilizer working backward or you have your ailerons flipped and I've done both, okay? Actually, most people in the sport have done both because it's a very easy one to do. Okay? And it's a very hard thing to figure out fast enough to- you, It happens meant, quick enough yeah. that the average pilot, even a skilled pilot with some experience is not gonna, the, your brain is wired to do it a certain way and when you deviate that drastically, your brain is like, no, no soup for you. So you just crash. 
So anyway, hopefully that stabilizer conversation helps you to kind of understand that is a huge value added thing. So just to give you an idea like that 620 compared to the 630, it's only like a couple numbers different, but the difference in price is considerable, right? You might be talking about a $100 receiver versus like a $50 receiver or an $80 receiver instead of a $50 receiver. So it's a big difference in cost because you're adding a whole nother feature set. And that feature set of stabilizer is the basis by which they also then apply that auto leveling. So when you let go of the stick, so I'm flying along and I've got the ailerons telling it to roll. Okay, great. Well, the other thing that happens in auto leveling is they limit your bank angle, okay? So if I go to auto leveling and I pull up on the elevator, okay, it's gonna let me go up until there. And see, it's not gonna let me go any steeper than that. That's pretty steep. Mm -hmm. Okay, now look, if I roll the plane, look, it's not gonna let me roll. It's only gonna let me roll so far until I get to there. So that's as steep as I can bank this plane. And you're like, well, why would you wanna limit the bank of a plane? Here's why, because people that are new pilots tend to do three major things. They over control the plane, A. They flip it over, B. And I like to say, C, they tend to give too much throttle the whole time, but there's nothing to fix that. So those are a few things that every beginner pilot tends to do. I suppose there's exceptions to all rules, but generally speaking, that's what people do. So the stabilizer in tandem with the auto leveling and limited bank and pitch angles are gonna give you the best chance at success. Now, what they're not gonna do is they're not gonna make that big 50 foot tree that's up there move. Okay, your plane's gonna keep moving and it will crash into the tree. It's just gonna crash you into the tree at a nice level attitude, okay? Right. So just keep in mind, a big open area is what you need when you're learning. So if you see our area and you think that looks great, it's still pretty tight compared to what you would want if you're an actual beginner. Unless of course you have somebody that sets up a buddy box and this is something we recently released a video on and what you can do is you can get yourself one of these computerized transmitter, again, not chasing good money after bad. You buy this, you set that plane up, and then guess what? You get yourself another computerized transmitter or just a basic ready to fly that's in the same protocol, DSMX. And then that second person can use and hold the second controller and you can, as a trainer, I can sit here and hold this button and give you full control. And then I see you're making a mistake, I let go and take over. And it's seamless. So we actually just did a video about how to do that and it's a very powerful tool. It's a tool that can take this plane and it can let anybody fly. Now, believe it or not, even with all the safety features built into this uh, for automatic leveling, um, the limited pitch and roll angles and stabilization, as well as being just a high wing trainer with a tricycle landing gear, with a spring-loaded nose gear, no less. You know, all these things stacked up, you're still gonna be scared to death the first time you take off. And you're probably thinking, whatever, I'm a good enough pilot. I've never done it before, but I'm good enough. Just do it. And then you can come back and watch this part and eat crow. Cause I'm gonna tell you something, guys. When you're flying it for the first time yourself and you get off the ground and you're like, holy crap, I'm in control of this thing and I have no clue what I'm doing. And you get mixed up once on what direction you're going, you're gonna immediately have a micro heart attack and you're gonna say, holy crap, that is a lot harder than it looks. And then you have this like weird epiphany and you're like, oh man, I've watched people do this for years and thought it was so easy. And you'll have this completely different appreciation for what you just saw for the last 20 years of your life, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, whatever it is of your life. And you're gonna think, wow, I've got all this ahead of me now. And so it's, you're gonna have this like weird flash moment in history where you realize I don't know how to do it. And yet you still have to land that thing. <laughs> and, you, and you guys that have flown before understand what I'm talking about. And you guys that have pretended that you've flown before will understand what I'm talking about. And those who have not flown are gonna be like, whatever, this guy's full of crap. Test me. You'll enjoy when you realize it, you'll get a kick out of it, I promise. It's a super fun experience. Flying radio controlled airplanes is one of the hardest 
but most immersive and rewarding RC experiences you can do because it's, it's by far the hardest thing you can do. Other than uh, helicopters, helicopters are harder than airplanes by a small margin in my opinion, or depending on what you're doing, uh, 3D wise, they can be easier if it's got auto leveling and all sorts of things, or they can be a lot harder if you're trying to do 3D and things like that. That's where I am right now is trying to get the 3D figured out on helicopters. And on airplanes, they can do mild 3D, but doing real 3D, I, it's just not my thing. So someday maybe I'll get it. But I'm just gonna tell you this, everybody's on a spectrum of, I don't know how to fly to um, God mode fly. <laughs> you know? and, and you're just always working at that. You wanna get as good as you can get um, so you can enjoy the most out of every flight experience. But I'm gonna tell you this, you're never gonna get anywhere if you don't start flying. And you won't start flying until you get yourself a model or something like this. Now, it doesn't have to be this one, but the thing is, this is a good option. And if you like this option and you wanna order one right now and get the exact same thing that you see here in this video, just follow the link in the video description below. And barring some strange circumstance, like it's 10 years down the road and you're watching this video 10 years from now in 2020, or excuse me, 2033, 33. then you'll be able to buy this exact item or something really similar to it, and you can follow along through the Unbox Build Radio setup and you can just do it for yourself. Just pick a good spot. Uh, if you don't have a good spot in mind, find, find a local club, get hooked up with a local club, they'll help you understand if there's any rules you have to follow. Um, rules are always changing, just like anything else. Just don't be a bonehead, you'll be fine. Try not to burn your house down. When you're charging your batteries, do it when you're in the area, do it on a hard surface if you've got it. If you don't have a hard surface, make a hard surface. Get a couple of cookie sheets, put them on the floor, put the charger in the cookie sheet, put the battery in the charger, um, just set it there. And then if, if something would go wrong, you've got a cookie sheet that's gonna help to absolve you of some, um, some risk. But just, just keep in mind, the other thing is don't get cut. Be careful, if you're not sure what you're doing, go ahead and take the prop off if you want. It takes about a minute to take the prop off. Now this plane is admittedly very simple, so I didn't take the prop off on it. But I just did a helicopter the other day and I took the blades off of that because I didn't want to get cut. Um, and granted, that would have been a little bit more significant, but still, even still, you just gotta, you have to know where you are and respond to where you are, okay? I'm not gonna tell you where you are because you need to decide that for yourself. But if you wanna buy this thing, you buy it from the links, you'll help support Brian Phillips RC and what we do here. Our mission is helping people get back in the hobby and then helping people get into the hobby helping to prevent one and dones. That means you get not this plane, but instead you buy this J11 and you spend a thousand bucks on this. And you spend a thousand bucks on accessories like the transmitter and the battery charger and the batteries. And then you go out and crash and you say never again. Well, we don't want you to say never again because you can fly this plane. If you're a really, really good pilot, you could be flying this the same year that you start flying this. Now you would be probably on the edge of like extraordinary in my opinion. But the thing is, most people aren't gonna get to that from here in one year. But the thing is, most people aren't gonna have the money to get from here to there in the first year because you're gonna have like seven other steps between here and there. But at the end of the day, I don't wanna put you guys in a cornhole. If you think you can do that in a year, you can probably do that in a year. Because I have safe on that thing. Doesn't mean it's easy to fly, it just means it auto levels. So, you're in the right place where we're gonna help you get from here to there or from here to this big yellow one back here or one of these other jets back in the background. It doesn't really matter which plane. What matters is that you start right and you work through the ranks because you have to get through the beginner stuff before you can advance and master it and move on to the next thing. This thing will be covered in hot glue and it's gonna weigh twice as much as it weighs when you first start, well maybe not quite twice as much, but it's gonna, be, it's gonna seem like it weighs twice as much when you're done playing with it. I'm just telling you. So don't go buy some super fancy plane for your first plane, you're just gonna destroy it. I mean, even I destroyed my other one, the, the SU-27. 27. 27. I destroyed it opposite that one, this on our main flight. So anyway, if you wanna have a good chuckle, you can watch that. But that's what we do here on Brian Phillips RC is we help you guys get exposed to the realities of RC aviation and we help you understand how and why we do what we do so that you can be a better pilot without having to experience the painful experiences that we've experienced learning through the School of Hard Knocks. 
Um, so if you wanna help support us, buy the planes from the links. That's literally the best thing you can do. Smash the like button, obviously click the bell for notifications when you're subscribing, please subscribe. And we'll see you here on the next video. We have tons of RC content. And also, if you, if you can't buy this from the link because you're overseas or maybe you know it's out of stock right now and you'd really like to get this, but you wanna wait on it, then you can support us in other ways too. We have Patreon, we have PayPal, do friends and family if you don't mind so nobody has to pay fees. And then we have membership. You can join our membership here on this Brian Phillips RC and really help us in our mission of helping to prevent one and done, get people back into the hobby and start people off fresh. So we're here for you guys. We're gonna to try to get you step by step from here to there. And at the end of the day, we have thousands of videos expounding into detail on a lot of these different things that we've talked about today. For instance, adding flaps, flapperons, two big topics of conversation that you don't even need to worry about if you're a beginner, but they will be a worry for you because you're gonna to wanna to add them. And we'll talk a lot about that. The other thing too is there's no LEDs on this plane. So that means you won't be able to fly this past civil twilight because it's going to get dark. You won't be able to see very good. That's one of the things we'll talk about on this channel is when we can see planes, when we can't, what type of visibility issues we run into. These are the types of things that you don't even know to ask if you're not in the hobby. As soon as you're in the hobby, you'll quickly pick up on all these questions that you didn't even know you needed to ask. And that's what we do here on this channel. So we hope we've wet your whistle just enough to get your foot in the door because once we get you, you'll never leave because this becomes a lifetime habit. I mean, hobby, and you guys will enjoy it just like we do. So we hope you'll, back, you'll be back for more here on Brian Phillips RC. We appreciate you being with us today. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned.